Okay. Actually, Michael, can I can I do a little Q and A with you real quick? Because I think no. Um, uh, <laughs> sure. You can do do a brief Q and A. So just quickly, like so, the idea with a hackathon in general is to like quickly come up with a new idea and finish it and present it. And uh, I think that that process could be really valuable for artists. And um, so. My idea is to sort of invite as many artists as I can to come here and just try to like start a piece and finish it by the end of the day and then perform it in concert. Why not? And so Michael is a very talented composer, um, completely unrelated to his composition life. He's also a programmer, um, computer programmer, I should say. Um, but so so this is our kind of our first attempt at inviting someone to to a hackathon, not to build a technical project with software, but to just write a piece of music from scratch um, in, in a very limited period of time, and uh, then have a musician learn it really quickly and then perform it right away. So that's that's why Michael's here. So what did you have prepared for this piece before you know noon today? Okay, well, I'll quickly introduce kind of where I was coming from. Uh, I'm writing a piece for in March uh, for a piano trio, the Hudson Piano Trio, based in New York, and I've been working on a piece. And usually, I spend a little more than one afternoon writing a piece. It usually takes quite a quite a few days. Um, how, how long normally? I would say a month to two months to write a piece. So pretty um, much working on it every day. Well, no, not every day, but thinking about it and kind of working through it. I would say 40 to 80 hours uh, usually to write a piece. Um, but uh, in this case. I kind of had it, I saw that he was doing this hackathon and I know he invites musicians, so I saw this opportunity, oh, I could write a piece on the spot and, and have it performed. So I said, why not do a little kind of an instant realization of what I'm working on and uh, try to realize something. But I mean, I, I knew it was a solo cello piece, I knew I wanted to write a short piece um, before I walked in here, but and I, I knew I had some melodies that I'm writing for a much larger piece. Um, but actually realizing or putting the ink to the, to the page happened here and it was kind of like under the gun where I didn't have time to second guess. I, it, it's actually really fucked with my head to to, um, to like write something and not sleep on it um, at all. It was actually, it's really, it's hurting my feelings because uh, <laughs> I just, you know, I need a little distance from my work but I don't know if I do this again but I definitely am happy with what I did and I'm really happy to be working with Colette. She was amazing and she just kept working through the piece. I was about to, you know, say, hey, you know, you're doing too much for this, <laughs> for this, for this, but uh, she's amazing, and I'm really privileged to do this. So thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Colette, and thank you for everyone for coming out.
Gotta go eventually. <laughs> yeah, okay. You need uh, audio, video? Uh, I'm sorry? The power supply, I need that. Oh, sure. Can you tell me what I'm doing? So, I'll explain briefly what this is. Uh, this is uh, basically I'm using a Dynamo as an input device. So, uh, when I'm pushing in here, this spins and I read the voltage from here. I have some discrete buttons here on my right hand and underneath. And I have a type, like a, an accelerometer here as well. Um, with this particular setup, uh, I, I put a simple threshold on. So if I press like real hard, it just triggers uh, an ascending, or like just like you play on a guitar, basically. Um, and then if you pull towards you, you play the other way, like so. <laughs> You can also change chords using these buttons here, so like... And also if you, um, if you tilt... So using the accelerometer, if you tilt the device, you can, you can change the speed. using the orientation of the device like that. setup is old, like I made it a, few, uh, a month ago, mm -hmm. but I used a different board, I used some different software, and basically the mapping I did here is something I haven't done before, so... It's, it's better uh, Well, I mean, you can basically do whatever you want, but I just wanted to try this guitar and sort of... Mm -hmm. Very cool. Thank you. Um, sounds great. Uh, could, could you do a short improvisation with it? Uh, <laughs> okay. Maybe a better question, is there a musician here who feels comfortable doing a quick improvisation on a brand new instrument? <laughs> feel free. I'll try it. Yeah, you should try it. Yeah. Yeah. Can I put it through my lead pens? Uh, sure. Yeah, no, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to do that. So, I can just give you like, a brief tutorial. Um, there's a button here. That changes major and minor. Okay. So if you press this one, you get major, and if you release, you get minor. And all of these buttons are mapped in a, like a binary, like so you would have zero one, zero two, zero four, zero eight, yeah. and then in combination you get fifteen different or sixteen different. Did you all get that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here you go. Because I did it. <laughs> it's like a trumpet. Sort of. <laughs> Which is the exact opposite of a cello. <laughs> Lack of a better word. Great. So. so if you press in words like slightly fast, you, yeah, so you, you have to trigger 
to do an improvisation because it's not responding the way that you want it to, <laughs> the way that I want it to. Yeah, is anyone a triple player? <laughs> recorder and a recorder. You have to push uh, like it. fast. Mm -hmm. subscribing to like 30 music blogs on Google Reader, then manually clicking on each link and looking for music videos and SoundCloud links to play, and it's really irritating and time consuming. So I built a scraper that will just automatically go through your Google Reader folder, visit all the pages, and pull out all the elements that you'd want to listen to. And I previously just had it as a flat page of just a bunch of YouTube links, but thanks to my excellent new teammates, we have moved to this much <laughs> lovelier setup where you will have uh, a single page that has a list of all the things that you can look at. It will let you favorite things, and you can either play a video, which sticks with you as you scroll, or you can click next, and it currently has to dynamically regenerate the entire <laughs> list of mm -hmm. possible videos. So it's a bit slow, but it will eventually, if it doesn't give me an error, mm -hmm. pull out. You can do it, little machine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it'll pull out an endlessly refreshing stream of the hottest new music videos from whatever music blogs you happen to subscribe to. And hopefully it'll be actually releasable maybe next month. So look forward. <laughs>
Instantrimshot.com. setting this up, I'll try to explain. So, um, I am the creator of a digital audio workstation called Zonami. Is that up there? No, it's not up there. Um, and uh, what's special about it is that it lets people collaborate from different computers at the same time. And um, so, uh, I've been showing it around. It's still, uh, it hasn't been released yet, but I've been showing it around to people and one thing they said was that people should be able to um, share the transport controls. Because the way it works now is that um, every user who's working on a project together, they can share edits together. So if one person makes an edit, the other person sees the edit. Um, and you know they share effects and all that stuff. But when one person hits play, um, they the playback but the other person doesn't which most of the time is what you want but a lot of people I've been showing it to said it would be really useful if they could both play back um, together so I'm going to open up the same project on this on the demonstration computer that I have open on this computer so I don't know if you can really see this but, um, so this is what's open here I'm opening it here and it takes a second. And hopefully it works. Okay. So you see that it's open here and I have the same project. And when I hit play on one machine, um, that computer plays. And when I hit play on this computer, that computer plays, which is usually what you want. Um, but when you make an edit, like I'm going to hit delete here in the middle of a section, and as soon as I hit delete, you'll see, boom, it deletes there. So you share the edits, which is the whole point of the workstation. Um, and uh, uh, But if I turn on over here the slave, so playback hits slave, if I hit play, if I select some area here, make it a short area, and hit play here. You see it plays back the exact same region. Um, so that's what I did today. And it also does, I had a little, I, I'll, I'll try this, I had a little trouble with it earlier. It, it should work with recording. So if I create a new track, it, this probably won't work, but... Uh, we'll, we'll give it a shot. So if I record on the track, mute it right away. Um, so this is really cool if your talent is in LA and the producer is in New York or something like that. And now I'm, um, so I've record on the track, I've set my levels. And uh, then I can, hopefully, it's probably won't, like I said, it probably won't work, but let's see. Um, I can record it from this computer. So let's see. Okay, 
Okay, so it actually recorded. And then what it's doing is uploading. That's what the little progress bar is up here. And now on this computer, brighten it up here, it's automatically downloading. And boom, there it is. So Ooh. the producer in New York can see it right away. So that actually worked. That was cool. So yeah, so that's that that little feature is what I added today. Nice. Do you have is there a website or something like? Uh, yeah, it's zonami.com. X O N A M I. I just have to switch the next. Yeah. How long have you been working on it for? Well, it was it was a side project for quite a few years. So, like, I can trace this back, like, ten years. <laughs> yeah. Why um, did you decide to do it? Like, what was the inspiration? It was just a hobby for a while. And then, um, and then I, I got a job doing a, actually, a file transfer project at a recording studio. They needed to, um, they had a lot of clients in Japan. And they were doing all this file transfer back and forth, and I just thought it would be a lot easier if you took. Because then they had a lot of interns doing the file transfer work, so the engineers would do the work, and then the interns would go onto their hard drive, copy the files over to FTP, transfer the files, and then somebody in Japan would would listen and approve it or or request revisions, and uh, so they hired me to do something faster than FTP. And they were so grateful, and they paid me a lot of money for this project. Um, and they were so grateful that it was like, I don't know, 30% faster or something, um, that I thought it would be much more useful in that kind of environment to have something that really worked more collaboratively and more seamlessly. So everybody, um, you know, like with this kind of thing, you don't have to uh, re-download the whole project if there's an EQ change. So if I add an EQ, you can't see what I'm doing, but I'm adding an EQ on this machine, and then boom, it should, yeah, it shows up there. You know, I add a high pass filter, boom, it shows up. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, because I'm adding it to the new track. That's why you can't hear it. But uh, anyway. Um, but so those kinds of that, that working this way is a, is a much smoother and easier way to do it. So that's uh, you know after working on that project for them, that's why I thought this would be a much smoother way to work. Yeah. Is it, I saw that there was a, a server that you connected to. Is that just to give the other uh, client address? Yeah. There's there's two there? servers. One for file transfer. Um, that actually stores the files. So if I deleted all these files from my local hard drive. It would fetch. It would just automatically refetch all the files, um, and it also keeps track of all the projects and um, undo and stuff. So you can actually go back and say, "Oh, I don't like the changes that somebody else made," and un undo and stuff like that. Um, sort of like a version control system. So that's one server, and then the other server keeps the two machines connected. So these aren't these machines aren't actually talking to each other directly. They're talking through an XMPP server. So that's how the, the edits go, and that's how the play information works. It is through the XMPP server. So that lets these two machines be you know, anywhere in the world, not just on the same subnet. Yeah. Um, is there any possibility in the future that they would be able to be implemented in other DAWs? Like Use this with Studio or I've, I've had conversations with a lot of other companies, including actually Ableton, and uh, it's they're these big, massive companies, <laughs> and they're all really excited about it, and it's it's like pulling teeth. They're, well, they're like, like, using yes. your, like using your program as like a VST, they would load into the DAW. No, I can't do it that way. They they because um, it's not the whole the whole system needs to work. Uh, with it, and I've had many conversations with with them, and uh, hours of <coughs> conversations with Ableton, <laughs> and you know maybe maybe someday, but for now.
I'd actually dumped this whole project because a bunch of other companies were wanting to work with it. And, uh, but it got, it got so slow that I revived it. So this whole long story. Anyway, but yeah. Maybe someday. You had a question? Yeah. Up front? You had a question? Yeah, it kind of is just answered. And my other question is kind of dumb, but <laughs> language. Um, the, yeah, the, the audio processing is in C++ and the UI is in Java. And I have a really cool open source UI toolkit for Java. It's, cool. <laughs> it's called SJ Widgets. <laughs> it's one you found or one you wrote? I wrote. Uh, I wrote it for another project at another company and I just got to open source it. They let me use it for this too and they just let me open source it. So, SJ Widgets. Cool. Who's next? Um, nope. Yeah, go for it. So, yeah, so what my, my goal today was to make a, um, a jazz drum machine. Okay, great, here we go. Um, so, yeah, so I took this drum solo by Elvin Jones, you see right there, um, great jazz drummer. Um, and I used the Echo Nest Remix API to chop it up into segments. Um, you know, so a segment is like a, the smallest sort of discrete musical event. So, basically one drum hit or one note. Um, and this Echo Nest Remix API also provides this really cool data like timbre and pitch uh, for each of these notes. Um, so once I had all these notes chopped up, um, I sorted them, I grouped them into eight clusters based on their timbre. Um, and that's what these eight sort of knobs correspond to, the eight different groups. And they, they sort of loosely correspond to like snare drum, kick drum, cymbals, toms. Um, and so the way this works, uh, and I'll let you hear it in a second, um, it's just like a one measured loop um, the, at the same speed as the original song. And when I turn up, you know, when I turn up one of these uh, knobs, you'll hear the notes from this cluster, that particular type of note, uh, played back at the original point that, where he played them in the measure. Um,
kind of some cool rhythms. So then I'll let you hear the other one. So this is, these are like the toms. So the really fun thing that you know I've been enjoying doing with this is just um, kind of like tuning them all up a little bit and mixing them together. Jazz drum solo. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah? So as you turn up the knob, it picks more and more of those similar drum sounds, right? Yeah, exactly. How do you pick like the first one and then the second one and then the third one? Good question. Um, so that's so when I sorted them into groups based on the timbre, the you know the type of sound. Um, you know you can sort of you can sort of imagine a graph of the timbre, and there'll be these sort of groups of the snare sounds all sort of over here. And the first sound you hear is the one that's like right in the middle, the most uh, the sort of central one in that cluster. Um, you know, and then sort of as you add in the other, you know, the more sounds you add in, the sort of farther away they are in sound from the center. So the first one's like the most representative. Yeah, exactly. The most typical of like that particular group of sounds. Yeah. Any more questions? Do you hear the original? Um, yeah, I can play the original. It'd be just interesting to hear. Sure. position of the sound that it originally appear, appeared within the meter, right? Exactly, yeah. So, like, if, you know, if mo most of the snare drums are probably on two and four, well, probably not because it's a solo, but for the sake of explaining how this works, um, yeah, like, so say every snare drum hit is on two or four, um, then, you know, when you turn up that knob, you'll hear the snare drum sounds on the second and fourth beat of this little one measure loop that we're hearing. Um, but in, in the solo, obviously, the, the meter is very flexible. Even the tempo is, is very flexible. There's places where you, the meter isn't always right, four, right. So and you know, and he's very, you know, he's playing a lot of notes and he's playing them all over the measure. So, so you're using Echo Nest's best guess at or Echo Nest's 
what it decides what exactly, it is yeah. in the and Right, which is, you know, which um, uh, isn't perfect. Right. Okay. That's for sure. Um, you know, like, as far as where, it's pretty good at the segmentation, at, you know, splitting up each node. Um, as, far, as far as, like, the meter, especially in something like this, it's kind of hard. It's, you know, it has trouble sometimes with, like, all right, where's the meter start? Where's this bar end, you know? Um, so really, your end result incorporates all that confusion in there, so you get a little bit of chaos. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> Have you done it with more straightforward drums, not a solo, and it, would, it, pro it probably has a much easier time with that? Yeah, that's probably true. Um, no, I haven't done it with anything but this recording yet. But, um, but yeah, it's, you know, I spent all day, I finished this like 20 minutes ago. Oh. Um, so, but yeah, that's, I'm excited to do that next to try with all sorts of things, you know, not even just drums, instruments, and whole songs. It would be cool speech. if you kept doing like a specific drummers, like a series of like best drummers, or whatever. Yeah, you yeah, that'd be cool. do it with other instruments, I guess. Yeah, yeah, other like solo instruments I think would be really cool, or solo voices would be cool. Yeah. So, um, did you get like Sam Cook, the best of Sam Cook? Yeah. <laughs> So the, the audio feature to... stuff you're you're using always tries to figure out what the meter is, even if there's no like meter present. Right. Even exactly. So it's just like yeah. someone talking, but still trying to figure out. What we the still try to figure out the meter. Yeah, exactly. Which would be totally, you know, nonsense. Um, so but it would, you know, but it would, it would play into how this how it ended up sounding in some in some nonsensical way. So it could be interesting. Wow. Cool. Other questions? Oh. All right. Okay. Thanks. Do you need an uh, amplification or a monitor screen? Yeah. Do you do? Yeah. Oh. Do you need a mic? I've got a mic on the PA. Second, let's check the mic first. Try the bottom unit. Oh, thank you. That's the problem. cylinders, so the strings have to be perfectly round. We found this out today the hard way. Yeah, after hours upon hours of hard work and deliberation. Yeah. Uh, we ended up using nylon guitar strings, and this was originally four feet. Now it's 26 inches, I think, because guitar strings are not that long, and we had to cut it down really fast. You know, we we're gonna do all kinds of other stuff with it, but we didn't have time because it wasn't working for like very for the whole day. Least. And we're trying to figure out what went wrong. Yeah. So. Um, now we, well, ideally, when we came here this morning, we set out to make this wind harp. And in, in addition to it, we set out to make. Um, we have this fan right, and we wanted to make a system that would modulate it, which is to say, you know, we wanted to have some electronics set up so that it would regulate the, you know, the, the, the how, yeah, how hard it blew against the strings and, you know, turn it on and off and do other cool stuff like that. And we were going to make this system Arduino controlled. Um, should I, who here doesn't know what Arduino does? 
That is, just what certification do we get for having a crowd where everybody knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Well, I don't know. So if you would like to explain... In layman's oh. terms, it's it's like a miniature computer. Just think okay. of it that way. Yeah, the Very guy, small computer that doesn't have a lot of memory. Okay. Yeah. The uh, person who did the uh, strumming in and out thing, he was using that too. Okay. So we, we're not using this. Yeah. At least not right now. So we wanted to set that up, and we also wanted to to have uh, to put this through effects pedals and stuff like that. We basically wanted to give it a whole electrical interface, but we so this is essentially maybe a third of what we were hoping to accomplish today. I was also going to try to get microphones that would pick up the sound directly from the strings, as opposed to having something like that, which would get all the fan noise. Yeah, uh, we're going to try remove as much fan noise as possible. We're not sure if that's actually going to happen, though. Yeah, that's sort of a problem. Just, sorry, yeah, sorry. Oh, the, the fan's really loud, and it kind of drowns out the sound of the wind harp. So yeah. we've, I mean, we've been spending the last 20 minutes or so trying to find a workaround for that. But yeah, I mean, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully, you guys will be able to hear something. And if not, just crowd around. Right. <laughs> speaker that way a little away from the yeah. speaker. Oh thanks. Most likely. Maybe. 
I mean, we can't say exactly why. Yeah. These work, those don't. That's our hypothesis. And you guys had problems with these tuners before, like they were coming at them. Yeah. Those are all things to be taught, right? Yeah, because yeah. these strings are a lot thinner. Yeah. Because they're guitar strings. Those ones were like massive, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe it's also the mass of the strings themselves that sort of vibrated mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. Where do you plan um, to use that? For what type of audience or uh, yes. musician? <laughs> <laughs> to be like wind chime. It seems like a good soundtrack kind of thing, like for a film. Or... Yeah, you, that's a good point. Yeah, sort of like ambient noises or ambient applications. Yeah, it could be like that like high-pitched like tension rising sound. Yeah, right. depending on how you tune it, maybe. <laughs> I was seeing kind of like dreamscape kind of. Yeah. Or that too. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think like air like wind sound adds to it too because you get that like whooshing like turbulence with the like nice mellow mm -hmm. yeah so it made me think of like yeah. i said i said skate because i was thinking of an environment where there would be weather yeah and had that yeah probably yeah. throw in some rain sounds too <laughs> yeah <laughs> can you do that can we do that with effects pedals <laughs> maybe i don't know you make rain as yeah. a guitar effect. <laughs> yes. I have a quick question. Uh, there are three of you. I don't think there are any other projects today that had more than two people. Um, how did the collaboration work uh, throughout the day? Like, did you how did you do up jobs or what was the decision making like? Well, I, it started off with uh, well, what I do is uh, I repair and I modify a lot of guitars. So I guess on my part was a, a lot in just putting it together at first because I don't really know as much. Or programming or any that or any of that other stuff. So you know, my hand in it was putting it together at first. So you know, figuring out where the uh, you know how we're going to mount the strings, what we're going, what we were going to use as a bridge, and sort of just the, all the problems and the uh, and just everything that comes with just putting it together at first. So basically, the entire hardware and non-electrical component. Yeah. See, he and I are basically on opposite ends of the spectrum because I do have a moderate knowledge of electronics and I know how to program. So, you know, we're kind of complete, I guess, opposites in terms of our labor division. And he's kind of like the head honcho because he studied electrical engineering and he's built tons of robots and he's done stuff with instruments. So. He kind of tied us both together, but at least that was how I saw it. I mean, I did a lot of the design for this, if you could call it design, because we basically took the design off the internet, and I got all the parts for the most part. Yeah. That was hard. <laughs> There's a lot of improvisation. Yeah, too. like, these things are hard to find. They were, like, at lows of 12 at night yesterday, like, <laughs> going, yeah. like, rectangular tubing guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, and, uh, These guys are going to go next, and you want to go after them? Sure. Okay, cool. It's, who else has projects? You have, a, you have something you want to present? Sure. No. No? Nice okay, that's cool. Uh, did you, do you want to talk about one of your projects at all? Or? Um, quick talk? Yeah, you can quickly. That would be great. Okay. And Brian, would you want to talk briefly about what you tried to do without giving anybody an epileptic fit? Uh, I can show static I think even explaining the meaning of that one visual chart, like the distance from the beat thing, I think would be interesting. Anybody else have a project that they want to try to do today? Present today? Ari, do you have something? No? Okay. So we've got one, two, these guys, you. Okay, great. And then she's going to play again. If you want to. I mean, I'm planning to try it. 
Are you okay? Cool. Oh, wait. Yeah. And so, what's kind of fun is like, oh, so so it's it's like it's it's trying to find kinds of music in session. Yeah. 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 Okay. Excuse me. All right. Let's go. All right. So uh, my name is Jordan. This is Mike. Hi, I'm Mike. Hi, uh, Mike. Hi, Jordan. We made a little bit of an instrument using uh, Novation Launchpad. Um, and it's basically a software synthesizer. Um, more or less what happens is we press buttons and it makes sight and sound. So. <laughs> I think I think we should show it off first. We'll okay, we'll show it off first. And, and, then, and then we'll explain how it, how it does its, its thing. Okay, is that how you're doing it? Can we yeah. use the light sound a bit? Yeah. Here, here, Really? sends that to processing. On another computer. On a different computer. So yeah, the visualization is actually on a, this other laptop down there. Um, so the Wi-Fi worked. That was good. Um, <laughs> then the processing, processing draws the circles, and when the circles collide, it sends an OSC packet back to Chuck, and then Chuck sends a different, s MIDI, sends signal. A different MIDI signal back to Ableton Live. 
So there's like a bit of a feedback loop going on between all the different systems. So yeah, that's it. Questions, comments, concerns? Concerns. <laughs> it's gorgeous. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. You want to go? Red shirt? Simple question. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Just, um, you know when the circles expand and, and when they intersect, does that create an extra sound? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. So, um, so the ones that were white, that you saw the white dot that began. That's and, where you pressed. Right. That's where I press. And um, the circle expands. The grid is like okay. the grid in the, the visualization. And then as I, as, if I let go, the circle starts to expand, and if two circles meet, yeah. um, that triggers the secondary note that oh. is in red. And it's only the first point that they meet at, right? Well, it's so when they meet, it actually determines a note in between the two notes yeah. in like a normal scale. So the where you where the way that they're drawn to the grid when you originally played them is really dependent on just the layout of this grid. Um, it's not really relevant sonically. Um, so when we have two notes that intersect, we find the, the sonic midpoint instead of the geometric midpoint. So basically, because those are a bunch of bullshit words, if you play an octave um, and you have two notes that are at the bottom end and the top end of one octave, when they collide, you want to hear the fifth. Um, but Geometrically, it may be something that's much closer to one note than the other, um, and it just it didn't sound very interesting. Um, so we kind of put away the notion of making it geometrically accurate and tried to make it sonically accurate. Well, um, specific, rather than geometrically specific, we tried to make it sonically specific. Yeah, I, it's not really accurate, <laughs> but it, um, <laughs> if you played an octave, was it, act, was it actually playing a fifth or playing a triton? It it depends. Wait, it's, which which note? The one that you play or the one that occurs? So, you want, so when the two circles collide, is it playing a tritone or is it playing a different? Well, I don't know because, like, what is the actual midpoint? When you actually collect connected, because there's. I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> Alright. It's, it's, it's not. There's probably some rounding going on yeah. in there. Oh, I see. Right, but so like, I must have chosen. Like, the, the fifth would be more um, to our ears. Right. Yeah. It's not quite in the, in the middle, right? But no, it's not the middle, but it's much more It's, guar it's guaranteed to be in between them. <laughs> it's, basically, it's basically the best guarantee I have right now. Um, the actual, like, all of the notes that are played are, are quantized so that they're regular semitones and not just, like, Totally microtonal. Yeah. Um, right. That all have steps, and we and I think that if we split an octave in the middle, we had to choose. We had to choose one of those two notes, and I don't know which one we which one did we choose. It depends on which which it all can source it's minute. closer to. Okay. Yeah. Okay.
Um, so I'm kind of like the odd one out with uh, no Mac, I guess. Um, I'm not really that into programming, I don't know that much, but uh, I do know a decent amount about producing music. So I kind of like made a challenge to myself, uh, see if I can write an entire song based on one audio sample. Uh, it's like good percussion, uh, leads, bass, everything, just on like one bass sound. So like this is the beginning sound. And um, I mean the only part I didn't get to do that was just part of the sample was uh, the kick. And I didn't have enough time to just make it sound the way I wanted. So I just used like one of the stock kicks from FL Studio. And uh, where did the original sound come from? The original sound came from a uh, sample pack that, like, one of the many ones I use, and it's just like a cut, I think, of a trumpet. Can you like, play it again? It's like, an, like a, probably a cut from like, like some like jazz, like fusion song. But uh, anyway, this is uh, what happened. I'm like slowly fading in effect. so much distortion on it that I started clipping beyond like a point where you couldn't even tell it was a sound so I recorded that then I brought that weight down with a compressor and uh, played that through a sampler and uh, yeah I just messed around with uh, different types of like filters for the percussion and the only part again was the kick but I couldn't even get that the way I wanted to sound so yeah awesome that's good cool Shoot. Um, what is your sound? Uh, or do you have? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> that's not like my, my uh, regular stuff. Though. My my regular stuff is more electronic. Don't care. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <it's like parties. laughs> uh, okay, it's A E O N. A E O N. Space. D E K K. D E K K. E R. E R. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. How old are you? Yeah. <laughs> 
So, um, so people tell me that jazz has interesting rhythm, and I believe them because I don't understand it, so therefore it's interesting. So I wanted to try and understand it. So, um, like the hack earlier with the, uh, the drum solo, used the FNS uh, segmentation, just carve up the beats, and uh, it worked okay. Uh, but you could hear, you know, snare drum would hit, and then cymbal would also hit a little bit through that and they would get mixed together. Right? So in general things are going to be offset in time. And that's kind of what makes things interesting rhythmically. Um, so that's kind of what I'm trying to visualize is can you look in time and see where instruments play relative to each other and see if anything cool happens. So I started making these plots earlier this week. So this this one is I think a Daft Punk song. So dance track, really steady rhythm, everyone's kind of aligned in time. So whenever you see a beat at time zero, you're very likely to see another beat up here. Right? So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And this repeats. Can you explain how the plot works? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't explain, but it'll take a long time. But basically it's correlating okay, I will explain. It's correlating different frequency bands against the main beat detector. So if you run a beat detector across the whole sound versus the beat detector just on the high end, the mid is the low end. That's what that plot is. So up and down is frequency, left and right is forward and backward in time. Does that sort of make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not a normal spectrum graph? No, it's not. All right. No, there's a lot of pre-processing garbage that went into this. Um, do the same thing on a jazz track, and it's much noisier. So here I've, I've taken this so Wayne Shorter song, Big Push, and it's broken up into six pieces. So here's the head. Uh, sax solo number one, trumpet solo, sax solo number two, piano solo, outro, and it's much less steady than the yeah, punk song. So What's the thing in the middle every time? The thing in the middle is the reference beat. So oh. if I see a beat right here, and then I look forward in time, where do I see the next beat? So that there, it's showing. There, so there's more. We're in the same time, kind of. Uh, yeah. So this is about three seconds wide, left and right. In that first frame. Uh, it's a su sum of all of the beats from between zero and a minute and 23 seconds in, or like if they're yeah, all overlaid? Much. Yeah, they're all kind of aligned on top of each other. Okay, with the, with the start of the beat at that little Yeah. Okay. And there's a lot of drift, a lot of noise in the beginning, and it doesn't really look like much. kind of stabilizes once you get into one of the solos. So you can see one, two, one, two, and then, you know, same sort of thing happens. Solos, but it's much noisier than you can see the song progression. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my goal for today was to animate this so you could view it in real time with the song. 
because, uh, yeah, you can plot it, but it doesn't really make sense unless you know the song pretty well. Um, well I think I kind of, I can show you what it did, it kind of didn't really work, but um, I had video transcoding issues, but let's take a look. See this video when you get this working. Um, I'll stick it somewhere. <laughs> uh, uh, the correct answer is at the February monthly music hackathon in NYC. Yes, indeed. <laughs> or on our research blog if it actually works well enough to want to publicize it. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll tweet about it or Tumblr or something too. It'll, 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 yeah. <laughs> so um, once you. Um, once you're visualizing this, what are you expecting to learn from the visualizations? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, no guesses? Well, as far as I know, nobody really visualizes rhythm on sets in a dynamic way. I haven't seen any of them. Don't help with that. Huh? Don't help with that, kind of. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Or the rhythmically challenge such as myself. <laughs> uh, basically, people were telling me that there's stuff in this song, and I just couldn't hear it, so I wanted to try and see it. Because um, that's how I do. But so I guess you could debunk their claims, potentially. Or verify them. Or verify them. I'm sure they're right. I'm just <laughs> trying to find data-driven proof of it. So, yeah, that's what it is. Any other questions? Cool. Oh, one more? No, I would just suggest uh, doing it with different songs and different time signatures. Stuff like that. So I don't know what. I, 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 I have that. thousands of these plots. Um, and time signature actually doesn't matter as long as the, the smallest note duration is about the same. Mm -hmm. So, like, I threw some prog metal at it and it just looks like a grid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> or, like, Apex Twin, I think. It's in here. Uh, uh, yeah, craft work is pretty steady. Yeah, it's pretty great. Uh, so <laughs> that was space life, by the way. You said it's dependent on the smallest beat and, and probably on the hierarchy. But really all music has it all boils down to the same kind of smallest beats and hierarchies. It's all just like if the smallest beat is constant, but if it's Oh, so pushing and pulling, that's what I'm trying to analyze. Yeah. So I guess music that's very rubato would look very different. Yeah. Um, or 8-bit covers of, of jazz tunes. So they're just like, from the kind of loop album, I just wanted to see what they did to it. And it turned it into a grid. So that was cool. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, what language is this coded in? It's all in Python. All right. Is there a library? Uh, sort of. Mm -hmm. So, in the lab, we're working on a library for doing audio analysis, and it's it actually started here at the October hack day. Um, and it's kind of gone in and out of development over the last few months, but yeah, it's on and off. It, the whole thing is like 30 lines of code. a lot like um, when you look at a video of the uh, auditory cortex when someone's listening to music. Kind of, yeah. you know what I mean. And obviously so, there's definitely correlation because it's, you know, this is being processed by, you know, yeah, that's video, what video. So, yeah. Wouldn't it be interesting to see if it's like, like how close that correlation actually is? Um, so the, the front end of the audio analysis pipeline is very much based on cognitive models. Mm. What's going on in the inner ear? So, yeah, that makes sense. Long term spike correlations. So, like the pixels so, behave like the neurons, basically. Well, they're change detectors. So, whenever there's an increase in energy in a frequency band, that's what it's firing on. And then it's correlating those changes to other changes. So, yeah, that's going to look like spike models. Um, interesting to look into. But also, that video is kind of garbage because it's not coded correctly. So, I wouldn't read too much into it. But even the uh, you know brain imaging videos are always garbage. Right? Well, <laughs> so it compares. No, they're good science. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I missed this. You mentioned the lab a couple of times. Oh. What do you do? I, <laughs> yes, I um, I work in a lab. Uh, I work in this lab at Columbia. Oh, okay. We do. What do we do? Organization of speech and audio. Other stuff. Psychoacoustics, that kind of thing? Uh, a bit of that. Yeah. Um, I'm actually loosely affiliated with Slap. I'm for real in the Center for Jazz Studies, oddly enough, though I had no, absolutely nothing about jazz, so I knew a lot about it. But, um, just, yeah. Follow the money. Yes. <laughs> and the money leads straight to jazz. jazz. <laughs> As it has always been. <laughs> Okay, so what I've been working on um, isn't necessarily too closely related to music. So it's not detecting the display for some reason. Um, that's okay. I'll sort of turn my display so you can see. 
So what I'm working on is a circuit simulator. Um, so I was hoping this is a project I've been working on for a while. I was hoping to link it to um, you know this project by uh, having it output music. But basically, it's just a, it's just more sort of a, a simple uh, JavaScript uh, Canvas-based circuit simulator. Um, so it'll simulate all kinds of circuits. Um, it's fully interactive. Uh, so I know it's a little small for you to see, uh, but you can see that uh, you know if you have a circuit like this. Uh, you have an inductor, a simple RLC circuit, um, and it will basically, uh, the, the yellow dots indicate direction of current, and flow of current. Um, the red and the green indicates voltage. So you can see as this swings from high to low and sort of dampens over time, uh, you can sort of see how the that oscillatory behavior of the circuit. Um, so it's good for, for modeling, good, good for conceptualizing uh, you know, how, how electricity flows, how current and voltages propagate through a circuit. So as I you know, mouse over each of these, you can see the current, the voltage, um, and resistance uh, for each component and whatnot. And I have some more um, advanced examples. Um, so like this is an example of a, of a, of a multipole filter. Maybe those of you who are studied electrical engineering are familiar with, like, it's basically a, a cascaded Butterworth filter. But you can see, you know, as the frequency, this is this is sort of a voltage source. It's still a work in progress, so I'm still working on generating a plot for it. You can see how, how uh, voltages and, and currents propagate through the circuit. So you, as you have different values of resistors and capacitors and whatnot, uh, you can you can make you know circuits as complex as you want. Uh, so this is like like a multi multi source circuit. So yeah, that's basically what I was working on. So I was hoping to sort of get this to emit sound, and you know, if you had like a, like a sinusoidal source, you could get it to uh, you know, a virtual speaker on, on a virtual circuit. But yeah, it's not. I haven't really seen like a good live uh, JavaScript circuit simulator. So for those of you who, who code in uh, or use Arduino or Raspberry Pi to type stuff, I think it's useful to be able to prototype or you know, have sort of like an online like GitHub, uh, but <coughs> but for for circuits instead. Um, so yeah, I built this from the ground up. I'd love to hear feedback. If for those of you who do like circuits type stuff or Arduino, I'm always looking for feedback. Um, I'm in electrical engineering, but I do a lot of programming too, and I enjoy hackathons and all that stuff. So, so yeah. Um, so I mean, you must be slow, like you know, visually here's like slowing down time. Oh yeah. Yeah. Is that a configurable? Yes. You can you can define the time step. Um, you can define the size of the time step. Um, so it runs it runs as fast as it can. So it runs usually at you know sixty frames a second or higher. So it would actually depend on how fast the computer is, how how fast it will run. Although you can synchronize it as well. But you can define the, the time step. But then you have other conditions like uh, stability, right? So so it's, it's a, if you're solving a differential equation and time step is too large, then you'll diverge from what you want over time. So it's sort of I mean I'm just riffing here. It's sort of like uh, eagle and an oscilloscope, yeah, like yeah. in one tool. Yeah. yeah, so I don't like eagle. I, I, well, but I mean, but you know, you know what I'm saying. But yeah, exactly. Like exactly. So, so that's kind of what inspired me to do this because eagle. I, I use eagle, and I was sort of put off it's by it because it's horrible. Yeah, because yeah. it's a terrible program. Like bird. What's eagle? Um, oh, eagle is eagle is a is a software package for designing circuits, and it's 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 pretty messy. So it's it's a it's a desktop based application. Um, and you know, it's used for prototyping and designing circuits. Um, you can do layouts and stuff like that. But you know, it's not convenient. You know, one thing that's like easy to use, like, like something that's, that's you can look at it and you understand what it does. Like something like this, you can you can you know, place uh, you can place resistors. It's it's a fully interactive circuit. So you, know, you can add components, you can remove components. You know, so I can like drag this, for example, and the circuit will update. Right. So there's no current flowing through this branch now because this resistor is removed, or you know, I could completely destroy the circuit. Um, and whatnot. So like like live analysis like this in, in Eagle is not possible as far as I know. But really any any circuit simulation. Like it's, it's usually these these circuit simulations are designed by engineers and they're they're very obscure for that reason. So you know looking more uh, having more user friendly user facing uh, type of program. Is this live? Yeah. This is just out there. Um, yeah, it's on GitHub. If you want to pull it on GitHub, I, I just pushed changes today. Um, my GitHub account is if you type in. Is it running somewhere on the internet? Oh, uh, this is this is on localhost, but okay. It's, okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to clone the, the repository, um, you can. Otherwise, it's not coming up. Uh, 
but yeah, I mean you could run it. You can run it locally. So this will run in a browser without needing to without needing to have a server. So it runs strictly in the browser. But I've tested it on Node and I've tested it running on backend as well. So it does run. It does run client side. So I want to like have have it be sort of like mm -hmm. hybrid where you could run it client side or, or server side. Like you have have it running in the cloud, but it could be broadcasting to a specific client. Like you know, like this is the voltage at this point at this time, or whatnot. Um, yeah, it'd be like an oscilloscope, right? So you could you could just you could hook up an audio jack to an oscilloscope and you could hear a tone. So something like that. It would need to be much faster, right? So this is like like this circuit's running at probably like this this voltage source is probably configured at kilohertz. So I mean, but but obviously if you look at it, it's like you know, you're seeing like like every second that goes by and as you're watching it is like a millisecond of time in the, in the simulator. So you know you would just play it back. You just sort of play it back, multiply the frequency by some scalar to get. These are like maybe a transient response. That wouldn't sound like anything, right? Right. Okay. Or at least it would be, yeah. It wouldn't, it wouldn't sound like much. Yeah. I mean, it would basically need to, but, but you can have like, like some, some interesting waveform or, you know, you could you understand like, like a so multi it needs to be like AC continuously changing. Yeah, it would need to be, it would need to be a time variant signal. <sighs> or at least a periodic time variant signal. What were your, some of your ideas about how this this could be uh, somehow related to music, used for music? Um, I mean, so like if you're designing filters, uh, music. It's it's interesting. I, I was I did some work on designing a uh, low pass, band pass, and notch filters for just just like for fun with with a, with a club group. And it was interesting because we're just designing analog components to, to filter um, audio. You don't really hear as much about uh, using analog. Everything's everything's in the digital domain now. Um, so I thought it'd be cool to sort of prototype and, and look at you know, signal analysis uh, virtually you know, and, uh, you know, in, a, in a virtual simulator environment. But it's also something that's cool because you can share ideas, right? Mm -hmm. So if you design a circuit, if you have like some prototype or whatever for, for Arduino, I mean, just generally, not just for music, you could, you could have something like this and just like link someone to it. But, but yeah, you could, you could you know, send them a link, you know, just like you do on GitHub, or just like, you know, send someone a gist or send someone a repository to deal with, with an Arduino design. So that's sort of the inspiration behind it. When I was a teenager, one of the first things that I thought was cool about music was you could buy a book and go to Radio Shack and buy some electro uh, electronics components and like build a distortion pedal or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so you could potentially like take one of those books and just input the design of the circuit mm -hmm. of that distortion pedal and see how it behaves and tweak it virtually and then make a new one or change a breadboard. Yeah, and, and you could have database that you could share with people, right? So you could like save that design and then, you know, send it to someone else. Or, you know. So this could yeah. be like potentially very helpful for like education, introducing people to... Yeah, that too. Because like, you can more easily, when a circuit looks like, when you can actually like see like voltages and currents propagating through a circuit, it's much more, it elucidates the, the inner workings of, of what's really going on in the circuit, you know, as opposed to just like, like looking at it on a breadboard, you know. Not, you know, nothing's interesting happening unless you're like, like hooking up an LED or you know, it's emitting smoke or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> you can't see the electricity. Yeah. This allows you to sort of see the electricity. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, cool. Yep. Yeah. 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 And rest assured, analog is not dead in the audio world. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm glad to hear you say that because it is, but I feel like it's sort of like this like, niche, like nerdy, uh, you know, hackerish. Uh, no, just go, go to AES or NAM. Yeah. <laughs> or any recording studio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I'm not playing that. Or right, right, right there. Right there. Just, just, just turn left. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But I mean, um, yeah. So there's not really like like to actually visualize how how it exists like in a physical circuit. Um, I think is is yeah. interesting. Yeah. How tough do you think it would be to merge something like this where you build something and then you integrate it with web audio? Um. Not too difficult. I mean. Yeah, it's just, I mean, so, so the values here are just, it's just a, a variable in the matrix that's being updated a certain amount of times. So you just output that value, that variable, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of sort of like cached in an array and just play back that in an array, like oh. create a buffer from, from what's playing here. Uh, yeah, so it wouldn't be that difficult. But you, you said you're updating 60 times a second now? 
Yeah, I mean, depends on the circuit, right? So I mean, right now this is probably updating less because this is a more complex circuit, but something that's like simple, you know, like something like, like this is obviously, you know, much faster. So you can see like it's, you know, like, I don't know what the frame rate is exactly on this, but uh, yeah, it's pretty, it'll update quickly. I mean, there's also, there's also some of the, some of the frame time, the significant time is actually just like drawing, mm -hmm. right? So you have, there's a certain fraction right. of things just drawing things. So there's, there's probably some stuff that could be parallelized with what you like brought out or optimized. You know, there's, there's also a lot of tricks like sparse matrix optimization. Um, so like when you model, this is basically a circuit solver that's, that's solving these, these systems. Um, and for those of you, like I don't know, if you're, for those of you who've dealt with linear algebra, when you, have, when you have a node graphic that has low connectivity, um, it, it yields a very sparse matrix. And so you can optimize a sparse matrix, you know, so it has much better performance than a dense matrix. Uh, so there's lots of little tricks like that. And things that, I, that, that are on my list of things that, to do, but I haven't gotten around to yet. Yeah, there's lots of little things you can do. It's, it's a very rich subject. I so mean, like, like these these programs like Eagle or Spice or uh, you know Cadence are basically.